From the heartland of the United States and one of the leading children's medical centers in the world, welcome to the Children's Mercy Kansas City Pediatric Bioethics Webinar Series. We invite international leaders to discuss critical and controversial issues in bioethics. Now, from the Bioethics Conference Center on the Adele Hall campus, here's Dr. John Lantos. Hi, everybody, and welcome back. We're coming to you live from the Bioethics Tower here in Kansas City. It was great to see so many of you here in Kansas City last week at the American Society of Bioethics and Humanities meeting. We're back uh, for our next episode of our webinar series. But before we get started and before I introduce today's speaker, let me remind people we are accepting applications for both our certificate training program, a mostly online training program in pediatric bioethics, as well as our one-year on-site fellowship in pediatric bioethics. The certificate training program, we have special uh, scholarships for people from low and middle income countries, as well as a nurse leadership program, which provides half off on tuition and some ongoing support for three years after you go back to your home institution. So go to our website and look at those if you're interested in learning more about pediatric bioethics. We also have a couple of great upcoming webinars on November 13th. Jenny Leinbarger, the head of pediatric palliative care here at Children's Mercy, will be talking about living or surviving. And in January, Carol Taylor will be talking about resource allocation and fairness, who's not getting a fair share of healthcare resources. For today's webinar, if you have questions, you see the little chat box at the lower right-hand corner of your screen. If you have a question or comment at any time during Professor Wilkinson's talk, just type that in. He'll talk for about half an hour, and then we will take your questions and read them out here. If you don't like typing in the chat box and you prefer to tweet, Go to hashtag CMBioethics and tweet us a question, and we will read those out as well. It is a great pleasure to welcome my friend and colleague, Dom Wilkinson, who has come all the way from Oxford, England, uh, to talk to us today about the case of Charlie Gard. Dom Wilkinson is a professor of medical ethics, the director of medical ethics at the Oxford Uhiro? Uhiro Center for Practical Bioethics. He's the editor of the Journal of Medical Ethics and the managing editor of the Journal of Practical Ethics. He trained at the University of Melbourne, got a master's degree at Monash University, and a uh, PhD in philosophy at Oxford in 2010. He's also the author of a book called Death or Disability. I left my copy at home, so all I have is this Xerox copy. But if you just read one book about neonatal bioethics this year, read this one. It's a great analysis of the ethical issues that arise as we try to decide which babies to save and which babies to let die. Professor Wilkinson is going to talk to us today about a difficult case from London, the case of Charlie Gard. Welcome. It's great to have you here. Well, thanks very much, John. It's great to be here. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to talk. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to be part of this uh, this amazing resource, the online webinar series. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about a case that I think many read lots about earlier this year. Uh, before I start, I should uh, note that I wasn't involved in any degree in the actual case. I had no conflicts of interest in relation to this talk. Uh, and I should also note that the information that I'm going to talk about is entirely based on information in the public domain, so I'm not going to reveal any confidential details because I don't know any. Um, but also, I think that's important and we might that might come up in ethical discussion because that's a limiting factor in terms of our consideration. Uh, there are only those facts that are in the public domain that we can talk about and debate about, and that's not the full set of relevant considerations. Okay, um, so what I'm going to do in this next half an hour or so is outline the case uh, for those who missed it, who were locked in a cupboard or uh, in Antarctica in the last six months, or uh, for those who perhaps only caught part of it in passing. Uh, I'm going to focus on what one question, what, what I see is the central question, but it's certainly not the only question raised by the case. I'm going to draw some contrasts uh, between approaches to this question between the US and the UK. And I'm going to propose a diagnosis 
uh, a differential diagnosis and a, a diagnosis that I think might be part of the reason, at least for the difference in approach. Uh, and then I'll propose an argument for how we should think about these sorts of cases. Okay, so the, the case, uh, as many will recall, uh, Charlie Gard uh, was born uh, in August 2016 uh, to parents Lond in London, England, uh, uh, an apparently well, uncomplicated pregnancy, no, no problems had been anticipated or were diagnosed, went home in the newborn period at, at a healthy, beautiful baby boy. Uh, but within a few weeks of birth, his parents had started to have concerns uh, that he appeared to be weak. He wasn't feeding as well uh, as he should be. Uh, he was losing weight. Uh, and uh, by about six to eight weeks of age, he was admitted to hospital, uh, seriously ill, um, to the intensive care unit at Great Ormond Street in London. Uh, and at that point, he had a number of clinical features. He had hypotonia, muscle weakness, uh, and respiratory failure. He needed to be ventilated. He had, there were renal problems, cardiac problems, liver problems, he had a raised lactate. Uh, he had he congenital hearing impairment, a constellation of features that made the clinicians so strongly suspect an underlying uh, inherited metabolic, particularly mitochondrial disorder. Um, uh, and uh, uh, by November, December, uh, that diagnosis was confirmed, um, first on muscle biopsy and, the and then later on whole genome sequencing. Uh, a very rare condition called mitochondrial DNA depletion syndrome. Uh, this is a, a genetic defect in the recycling of nucleotides. Um, and he had a, a, a variant of this, the encephalomyopathic variant, um, uh, which is due to a, a defect in de novo synthesis of nucleotides. So just as an analogy, I'm not sure how many non-medical people are in the audience. Um, the problem that he had uh, was in the, the energy source for his cells. It's a little bit like getting a mobile phone with a faulty battery. And the, the problem with the, the battery is it starts out, your phone's working fine, but it doesn't charge up properly. Uh, so every time you plug it in, it lasts for a shorter time. Uh, until with your phone, you're having to put it uncharged the whole time to be able to use it. That's not so useful. Maybe you can replace the battery, but you can't replace the battery in all of the uh, billions of your cells, the mitochondria. Uh, there are these two forms of, of mitochondrial DNA depletion syndrome, two rare forms. He had the rarest and most severe form that affects both muscle and brain. And the genetic form uh, it has this name of RRM2B. Um, in November of, of 2016, uh, the doctors and his parents uh, had talked about uh, the option of tracheostomy and long-term ventilation. The doctors felt on the basis of his uh, severe condition, which uh, all previous cases, inf uh, infants had died within a short period of birth, that this was not in his best interests. And so uh, it was decided by the clinical ethics committee at the hospital at the time not to proceed with tracheostomy. Uh, and by December, he had started to have seizures, electrical seizures because he was paralyzed and the external manifestations were, were few. But his parents understandably struggled to come to terms with, with this very severe diagnosis and started to seek out other treatments. They thought as many parents do, surely in this day and age, there must be something that can be done. Uh, and in December, his parents uh, got in touch with a family in the US uh, who'd had a child with a different form of mitochondrial DNA depletion, the muscle only form, the myopathic form, uh, a child who had some years before been started on an experimental treatment. Uh, this treatment involved replacing uh, uh, or supplementing nucleosides. So to, to overcome the defect in, in synthesis of nucleotides, you provide a supplement of, of these related compounds, nucleosides, which allows in theory, to buy, you can bypass this metabolic defect and uh, synthesize more mitochondrial DNA. 
Uh, and in very late December, the doctors at Great Ormond Street discussed with a, the doctor in the US who had uh, pioneered this treatment and who was offering to to provide it for Charlie Gard. Uh, and the, the story at the time was that severe brain involvement would be a contraindication to this treatment because the treatment had been shown to be useful in improving muscle strength to some degree, but not brain involvement. The hospital in London planned for Charlie to have a tracheostomy. Uh, they planned for special approval of this uh, previously un, uh, a treatment that had never before been used in the UK uh, and indeed never before been tried in Charlie's form of the illness. Uh, however, they also did some further investigations which included an EEG that showed that uh, Charlie was severely encephalopathic. He had a very abnormal uh, ha had almost continuous seizures and very abnormal EEG. And they decided on that basis that he had severe brain involvement and that he wouldn't benefit from treatment. So they cancelled the tracheostomy, cancelled the ethics committee uh, meeting that was going to uh, look at provision of this experimental treatment uh, and told his parents that they, they couldn't and wouldn't provide this treatment. Charlie's parents uh, again found this very difficult to accept and started crowdsourcing at the end of January, funding uh, for Charlie to go overseas, to go to the US to receive this treatment. Uh, uh, and at the end of February, the, the doctors in uh, Great Ormond Street applied to the High Court, the, the um, family division of the High Court, um, for a decision. They couldn't agree with the parents about what was best for Charlie, so they sought a court opinion uh, and in particular, they sought the court's permission to withdraw life-prolonging medical treatment. Uh, they applied at the end of February and there was a hearing uh, in early April. Uh, by that time, the family had reached their funding target of £1.2 million, uh, which was the amount that they thought that they would need to be able to take Charlie to the US. Uh, as many will be aware, there were then a series of uh, court uh, appeals. Uh, so the first court decision uh, was uh, heard, uh, the first court judgment was on the 11th of April by the High Court uh, in favour of the medical professionals, in favour of the doctors. Uh, uh, if you're interested, the, the whole court transcript provides a, a, a very long and de detailed assessment of how the, the judge reached the decision uh, that it was not in child, Charlie's best interests to provide this treatment. The family appealed to the Court of Appeal, that's the next level of court in the UK. Uh, they lodged an appeal at the beginning of May. By the end of May, the Court of Appeal had rejected that appeal. Uh, they then went to the highest court in the UK, the Supreme Court. Um, uh, and on the 8th of June, the Supreme Court did not give leave to appeal. The Supreme Court has very limited uh, situations where it is able to hear an appeal. Um, uh, and they didn't feel that the case uh, fulfilled the criteria. However, the family notified that they were planning to appeal to the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, and so the court uh, told doctors to continue treatment pending that appeal. Um, on the 27th of June, the European Court of Human Rights reviewed the basis, the legal basis, for the uh, lower court's decision in the UK uh, and concluded that it that that decision didn't uh, uh, constitute a breach of Charlie's uh, human rights as set out in the, the European Convention. Uh, and so that was seen to be the final legal uh, barrier to doctors withdrawing treatment against Charlie's parents' wishes. However, as many know, uh, the story didn't stop there. The, uh, there was a huge uh, by that stage, huge media interest and public attention to the case. Uh, there were statements of support by the US president, by the Pope, by many, many around the world. Uh, and there was a suggestion, uh, in particular by a number of doctors, uh, uh, by some doctors in the US and in Italy, uh, that there was some new evidence. Uh, and the hospital actually went then back to the original court and the original judge and said, well, there's a claim of new evidence we don't feel we can, uh, we can make this decision. We still think it's the right decision, but we want you to, to look at that. So the judge uh, 
re-looked at this claim of fresh evidence, uh, invited the US specialist to come to the UK to examine Charlie because there was a particular question mark about whether or not he uh, was uh, aware of all the salient facts, uh, which he did on the 17th of July. Uh, there were some further scans of Charlie that were performed at that stage. And at that stage, the professionals, I understand both the Italian and US professionals, uh, told the family that there was no longer any possibility at all that the treatment would help Charlie. Uh, and uh, to Charlie's parents' enormous disappointment, uh, they reached the conclusion that, that it was no longer helpful to continue treatment or to hold out hope of this treatment. Uh, and treatment was withdrawn uh, a, a few days later. OK, so that's the, that's the case. Many of you I know are, are familiar with that already. The ethical question that arises from it is this one, I think. Or at least the central ethical question is when, if ever, should parents be overruled, particularly in relation to provision of life-sustaining treatment, like, a, like mechanical ventilation? Is it ever ethical? When is it ethical, if it is, to withdraw life support, like uh, mechanical ventilation, against the wishes of, uh, of parents? Well, one answer to that question that many of you are going to be familiar with is that the, the underlying ethical principle is the child's best interests. And therefore, if treatment wouldn't be in the child's best interests, uh, it would be ethical not to provide the treatment. Uh, it would be unethical, in fact, to provide it. Uh, Contrary-wise, if it would be in the child's best interest, it should be provided. But one problem that's going to be familiar to many of you is if you're thinking just in terms of the child's best interests, then, then what role do we think parents uh, have to do in this decision? It it's reduces substantially the role of parents in decision making. It's just a decision about the child's best interest. What role have parents got to do with that. Um, I've argued, and many others have argued, that there's got to be some space for parents in decision making. There are going to be some decisions where treatment's clearly in a child's best interest and, and must be provided. Uh, that's in the, the top region of this, this figure here. There are going to be some cases where treatment is definitely not in a child's interest and must not be provided. And there's some space in between. Um, now, uh, ethicists, pediatricians have been thinking about this space for pa parental discretion in decision making for some time. That there are different accounts of what makes it ethical for parents to decide whether uh, it's uh, parents who are rational, who are not unreasonable, uh, some sense that they have some constrained autonomy over these decisions. Uh, but many of uh, uh, and th these uh, terms come from an excellent review by Ros McDougall and Lauren Nattini from the Children's Hospital in Melbourne. But on many of these accounts, uh, uh, and in particular on, on Doug D. Kima's uh, very influential account, that the boundaries, the edges of, of parental discretion are marked by what we might call the harm threshold. So the idea is simple, simply if treatment would be harmful to the child, that's going to fall outside. The, the zone of parental discretion. Well, when it, when it comes to Charlie Gard, then the question is, was, was what his parents were requesting harmful to him? That then transmutes this, this central question. Now, some years ago, when I was uh, thinking about prognosis, treatment decisions for, for children in intensive care, newborn infants, where uh, my particular focus of attention, I suggested that uh, in, in my book that a, a child with multiple very severe impairments, perhaps uh, cognitive and physical, maybe combined with, with sensory impairment, in, in combination with ongoing severe uh, painful illness or, or painful or invasive medical treatment, that that, if anything, fell into this zone where treatment shouldn't be provided, uh, even if parents request it. Uh, and it seemed to me on the information that was provided uh, about Charlie Gard that this was, in fact, a, a quintessential case that met all of those criteria. Um, however, not everyone agreed, as, as uh, those in the audience may be aware. There are others. Uh, Doug DeKima, uh, 
uh, Seema Shah writing in JAMA, felt that uh, it was hard to argue that allowing his parents uh, opportunities to explore experimental treatments was sufficiently harmful to Charlie that the choice should have been precluded by the court. So there is, there remains, we may have more discussion about it later, different views about whether or not uh, it would be harmful, would have been harmful to provide this treatment. Well, one of the things that was very apparent in the public debate uh, is that there are differences in approach to these decisions between uh, the US in particular and the UK. I mean, at, at stake here were views in particular in favor of treatment from the US and professional views, at least, uh, from the UK uh, that were divergent. So what, what is it that, uh, that's behind this difference of, of approach? Well, just to point to the magnitude of the difference of approach, uh, many of you are going to be fam familiar with the types of cases that reach the media in, in the US, uh, the, the types of legal disputes about treatment, which have often been decided uh, in favor of parents, in favor of uh, providing treatment uh, in a paper that I uh, wrote with uh, John Paris, published in, in Journal of Perinatology. We talked about uh, the directions of, of many of these treatments. Then the US decisions are not universally in favor of parents. There was a, a case earlier this year in, in Vanderbilt. Um, there are some cases where, where courts have uh, decided in favor of withdrawing treatment against the wishes of parents. But in contrast, in the UK, this is an excellent review by uh, Gabe Bosley and Thad Pope in, in Chess from last year. These are the cases uh, of disputed treatment. The ones highlighted in yellow are children since, uh, uh, since 2010. Uh, by my count, from 2010 to 2015, there were 15 cases that reached the, the courts in the UK where uh, doctors felt that continuing life-prolonging treatment or providing life-prolonging treatment was not in a child's best interest uh, uh, and the, against the, the views of, of parents. And in almost all of those cases, the courts decided in favor of uh, the health professionals. In fact, in just in this year, in the first half of this year, there were five cases that reached the, the court in the UK. Uh, for example, an 11 year old boy with advanced bone cancer, uh, doctors wished to provide with palliative care, parents didn't agree, were opposed to provision of palliative care. Uh, there was a child, a young infant with inoperable complex congenital heart disease, doctors didn't wish to provide resuscitation. Uh, there was another 11 year old with a uh, child with severe multiple disabilities, uh, doctors didn't wish to provide invasive life prolonging treatment. In all of these cases, uh, the courts ultimately decided in favor of not providing the treatment. So a very different uh, result of, of these conflicts on, on that side of the, the Atlantic. If we think about the, the model of decisions, it looks like uh, in the US, uh, the zone of parental discretion is much wider. The, the bar at the point at which uh, the courts at least uh, and doctors maybe are willing to go against parental wishes is very low, if at all, um, compared with the UK. So what's behind that? What, what's the reason for that? Well, one, one thing that's pointed to in the, the review article by uh, Bosley and, uh, and colleagues uh, is the structure of the legal system. They point to the fact that in the UK, in particular, uh, these decisions are, are precedential. So they influence subsequent decisions. The reasoning, the rationale is publicly available, which enables uh, a, a societal debate about how these decisions should occur uh, and has enabled over time a, a, a body of case law to emerge that attempt to consistently apply a set of ethical principles. Uh, and that's not the case in relation to the uh, decisions that are made in the, U the US. Um, uh, in our, our paper with John, my paper with John Paris, we talk again about some of the structures of appeals uh, in the US that, uh, that mitigate against um, going over parents' wishes. But I, I think there are some other underlying value differences. What, one possibility is that there is just much greater uh, weight given to parental autonomy in the US. Uh, they certainly talk about the presumption of parental autonomy in, in some descriptions of US law around uh, pediatric decision making. Uh, 
But if that were the, the explanation, we'd expect the zone of parental discretion to be wide in both directions, both in terms of providing treat, uh, of parents being free to say, no, we don't want treatment for our child, even though it would be in the child's best interest, as well as parents demanding that treatment continue. And that doesn't seem to be the case, or at least not to the same degree, uh, that parents can say, no, we don't want chemotherapy for our child uh, with an eminently curable malignancy, or we don't want antibiotics. There are those cases. Uh, and there may be some degree, but not uh, to the sense that parents can just make those decisions. In one reason that might explain is in terms of the underlying kind of ethical justifications for parental involvement in, in determination of the best interests of the child. So in my book, uh, uh, I explore uh, explored some of the, the reasons why parents are relevant to the best interests of the child. So if we take it a starting point that we should be thinking about what's best for the child, parents' views might be important because they help us to know the child, what the child's experience, what's good for them. Um, they know, uh, particularly for older children, they're going to know an awful lot about the child's health condition. Um, but even in Charlie Gard's case, his parents had spent hours and hours at his bedside. Uh, they had strong kind of epistemic authority, not that that's going to necessarily trump other accounts, uh, to know what life was like for Charlie. Parents may influence the interests of the child. Um, I argue and have argued that in the context of moral uncertainty, where we're going to have, it's just not clear what the right answer is, um, we ought in general to favour the views of parents. It seems unreasonable if it's not clear what the right answer is for others' views to, to take precedence. Uh, and I also argue that parents' interests count to some degree. Uh, and each of those are a play out, to unpack to varying degrees in these decisions. Um, but the bottom two, this question of moral uncertainty and the question of, moral, of parents' interests, it seems to me, at least on understanding the way that the courts think about these decisions in the UK, are given much less weight uh, then potentially in other jurisdictions. So that might be part of the equation, a different understanding of how parents are relevant to a child's best interests. Um, however, I want to propose a different diagnosis, or at least to explore another potential explanatory diagnosis. Uh, and this is not a novel suggestion in relation to Charlie Gard. There were lots of talk at the time that what was going on in the Charlie Gard case was rationing. Uh, so. Famously, infamously perhaps, uh, the US Vice President claimed that the heartbreaking story of, of the 11-month-old Charlie Gard is a story of a single-payer health care. Uh, American people ought to reflect on the fact that uh, that's where single-payer health care takes us. Now, I, as I argued at the time, and as, as, uh, and, um, as others argued at the time, there were a number of reasons to be skeptical about that claim that, that this case was all about resource limitation. Uh, so here are three, three of those reasons. So one of them was that the doctors uh, at Great Ormond Street were prepared to provide this treatment. They were going to get it. Uh, they were prepared to, pr to continue intensive care. Uh, they were prepared to fund it until the point at which they felt that it had no prospect of benefiting him because he was in Kephlopathy. So it wasn't a question that there wasn't funding available. They thought as long as there was some benefit, they were willing to provide it. Secondly, and very obviously, the family in this case had raised funds to take Charlie out of the public health care system. So in fact, the strongest resource argument was in favour of allowing the, these parents to travel. It cost a huge amount to continue to provide intensive care. It cost a huge amount to mount this legal battle. If it was really about resources, they should have just left him, let him go. Uh, and thirdly, the legal basis for these decisions, the court transcript is absolutely clear that they completely set aside any question of resources. Their basis for making the decision, their reasoning was entirely based on what the court felt was best for Charlie. However, I don't think it's as simple as that. I think that this case and other cases are at least partly about resources and uh, one of the reasons is uh, that when we think about the reasons to potentially not provide treatment that, that parents are requesting, there are these two different reasons that may come together or may come apart. So 
If parents, patients, families are, are requesting a treatment, doctors don't want to provide it. There are two fundamental ethical reasons not to provide. One is that it would harm the patient. There's the harm threshold again. But the second reason is that it would harm other patients. Now, these two reasons overlap. Uh, and sometimes they come together and sometimes they come apart. And it's not always clear which one's doing the ethical way. However, if you're in a system with limited resources, it seems plausible that you're going to have less scope for parental discretion. Or to put it the other way, if you've got a system with ample resources, no scarcity, you've got more space for allowing parents to choose treatment. So it seems that at least in part cases, past cases, the precedents, the, the, the language, the, the types of cases where uh, courts had decided in favor of the health professionals, in favor of withdrawing treatment, that those may well have been influenced. So that the, the, the framework, the limits in past cases where it wasn't a question of taking the child overseas uh, were partly about resources and that if those were applied to the current case, that influenced potentially where the harm threshold was drawn. There was an additional element uh, which wasn't much discussed at the time, which was the influence of the guard case on future cases. So even though this case was about provision overseas, if the courts had agreed uh, with Charlie's parents to allow them access to this experimental treatment, if the appeals, at, for example, of the European court had been successful, it would have had very substantial impact on other cases, even if they were about provision of treatment within the public health care system. Because other families in this really awful situation would have said, just look at that case. We're going to fight. We're going to take it to the court. We're not going to accept what the doctors have to say. We'll appeal repeatedly. We'll go to the media. We'll go to the president if we need to until we get a decision that we want. So I don't think the, the case could be taken in isolation, even though there was an attempt by the court uh, to, to focus on the child itself. And thirdly, and perhaps interestingly, and we, we may discuss it more, there is a question of resources, even about provision of privately funded treatment. So uh, uh, a colleague from the US described, the, described to me his experience of, of the pediatric intensive care unit where he works. He says, we have uh, X beds in our pediatric intensive care unit every day. We look at the patients who we have. We're full almost all the time. We, we look, say, who's going to be discharged? Who can we admit? Can we do elective surgery today? And some days you, you, they can, some days they can't. Can we accept transfers of patients? If they'd accepted Charlie, they would have had for a period of the next three months, X minus one beds in their intensive care unit. So even in that context, scarce resources are an issue. So resources are still there. So, so to the argument, and I'm running out of time, so I'm going to present this fairly uh, briefly, and we, I'm sure we'll come back to it in questions. When should parents be overruled? I've claimed already that we shouldn't allow parents to choose treatment that would be harmful to the child. However, that question about harm, there may well be reasonable disagreement, where there are professionals willing to provide treatment who are saying, we think this would benefit the child. The presumption is going to be saying, well, OK, you, you can, can go and get treatment from those professionals who are willing to provide it. Where there's possible benefit, we're, we're going to err on the side of allowing parents to seek that treatment. But when treatment would potentially harm others, particularly in the context of scarcity, where providing treatment to this patient will mean another patient can't gain access, um, where providing treatment will probably harm others, we need to limit uh, th those choices. So this is the second justification that is going to be relevant, uh, regardless of the healthcare system. So we need to think separately about these questions when we're trying to decide whether to provide treatment. There, I, I suggested in my model before that there was this single lower line. In fact, there are two. There's the harm threshold, but there's also a higher resource threshold. And where those two are is going to depend upon the resources available within the healthcare system. Uh, parenthetically, if we're thinking about adults, we might have a much lower harm threshold because for our adults, we're arguably going to allow people to choose more harm for themselves. Not necessarily any harm. There's a, a great quote that uh, John Paris drew to my attention that we quote from Plato, who, who said, for those whose bodies are riddled with disease, Aclepius uh, 
uh, or Aesculapius did not attempt to prescribe a regimen in order to make their life a prolonged misery. Medicine isn't intended for such people, even if they're richer than Midas. So that even if there's people are richer than Midas and willing to pay for treatment, there might be other reasons to sometimes limit. But it does suggest that for adults, we're going to have a, a, a broader, a much lower threshold. Um, but how would we do this? How would we separate these, these thresholds out? Well, we might try, I've been trying for some years to think about how we might set, develop some explicit thresholds within, for example, a public health system uh, for when treatment is no longer affordable, no longer uh, able to be provided. But there's been very substantial challenges in, in making such explicit thresholds. I suspect that like futility, like the problems of defining futility, we may be better to think about a procedural approach so that the, uh, the treatment boards, uh, consent and capacity boards in Ontario, the, the TADA panels reviewing decisions, but we may be better to uh, think about a process for dis deciding in individual cases whether this is a reasonable use of resources, whether it actually seems likely to benefit this patient much less than others who, who are in need of the therapy. Um, I think there are strong arguments in favour of transparently identifying this separate rationale for limiting treatment. Um, it allows scrutiny of decisions, it allows the reasons to be out there and to be debated. It allows the healthcare system to say, hang on a second, we are limiting on the basis of resources, so maybe we need to put more resources in, maybe we need to, well, maybe we need to make people pay more taxes. Maybe we need to spend less on whatever your least favoured thing is in the, in the budget. They're, 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 uh, making it transparent makes it clear that uh, what the consequences are of limited resources. Furthermore, if you make it transparent, then you potentially allow parents to potentially access treatment where they can self-fund it elsewhere. Are there arguments against transparency? Uh, well, that, that's kind of harder to mount. I think there are arguments against resource limits. People are very uncomfortable with them. I think the only plausible argument against transparency are the political ones, that this is just politically impossible. Uh, because obviously what I've described, this process, a panel looking at decisions, these are death panels as, described, as understood within the, the cultural debate. Uh, does that mean that it's impossible to have such a process? It might mean within at least some, some systems that it's impossible to have such a process. Um, but that doesn't stop us from saying, well, that it would be better. That would be a better way of doing it. Okay, so I'm going to wind up here. Um, I've talked about the, the, the Charlie Gard case. I've suggested the, the fundamental question is when parents should be overruled. I've argued that at least part of the difference between the US and the UK in where the harm threshold is drawn is a function of resource limits within a differently structured healthcare system. Um, and I've argued that we should acknowledge, be clear about, be open about the, the limitation of resources as a reason for limiting parental choices, um, though obviously there are very substantial challenges uh, in, in actioning that. Um, for those, uh, I should acknowledge my uh, uh, close colleague and collaborator, Julian Savalescu, who, uh, who I've written lots about this case and, and other uh, others with. I should also acknowledge that he has different views on the particular case than, than mine in terms of the question of whether treatment would be would have been harmful for Charlie. We've collected together lots of the resources in relation to this case uh, that people may find useful, including a number of the articles uh, that we've written about it. Time for questions, I think. Thank you. Well, let me remind people online, if you have a question or comment, that little chat box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, or tweet us, hashtag CMBioethics, Children's Mercy Bioethics. I have a question. Mm -hmm. The court uh, explicitly said this is not about money, this is not about resources, it's about what's in Charlie's interest. You seem to rest a much bigger part of your argument on the resource allocation argument, and to say, in essence, you don't believe the court. 
uh, or you think the court ought to have explicitly addressed the resource issue? So, so uh, as, I, as I suggested, I think harm to others, harm to the patients are individually sufficient conditions for limiting treatment. So if either of them hold, now I, I happen to believe that there were good reasons for thinking that this treatment was not in Charlie's interest, that it would have been harmful to him. Um, however, even if you don't accept that, I think there were reasons in terms of limiting resources uh, for thinking that. And, uh, and part of what I was arguing here is that it's, it's hard to completely separate them because the way that we, the barriers that we set in terms of harm to the patient are infected by, they're influenced by the resource constraints. And part of the argument was to say, it might not have made a difference in this particular case, but we do need as a society to be able to separate these two out. Partly because then that it allows us to make, to differentiate those decisions where we wouldn't provide the treatment in the public health system, we might provide it outside the public health system. And, and presumably any expensive treatment will cause harm to others. So, right. so the, the question of the, the question of harm to others is about how, how much, what's the comparison between the benefit to this patient and the potential benefit to others? Now this, it's a particularly pointed issue. Why, why are all these cases about intensive care? Um, well, it's particularly because intensive care is not only expensive, but it's scarce. Uh, and so by scarce, there is insufficient supply to all to, to meet the demand. There are patients every day in this country and others who are not admitted to intensive care because if they get admitted, somebody else can't be, or because there are no beds. Um, that's an even, now although we're talking about children and infants, this is not an issue that's isolated to children and infants. In fact, my experience of adult intensive care is that this is a much bigger problem in adult intensive care. There are many more patients who don't get admitted to adult intensive care because of limitation of resources. Because admitting this patient will mean somebody else can't be admitted. And the value judgment is that that patient has a better chance of benefit, a better magnitude of benefit, uh, or perhaps will simply need treatment for a shorter period of time. Um, so uh, that, that's, yeah, that's the way and in some ways, you were very kind to your American hosts here, at least kinder than one of the doctors at Great Ormond Street, uh, who said that cost and money plays into this case in a very different way, that in the UK, she said, we focus on what's best for the infant, whereas in the US, they'll do anything as long as the money is there, implying that the conflict of interest that might arise in limiting scarce resources also arises in reverse, in providing treatment that we are sort of like uh, the doctors Escalapius was warning against, willing to treat Midas even if he's riddled by disease. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, I think there were those claims. I, I, I'm personally, I'm not uh, wanting to cast aspersions on the US pro professionals involved. I, I'd prefer to assume that they had absolutely the best of intentions and that they were sincerely motivated um, by what they felt was uh, was a, a chance. And the, the professional involved said that he didn't think this treatment was going to help Charlie, thought it was extremely unlikely. But he understood that the alternative was that Charlie would die. And he said, well, I simply want to help the parents. Mm -hmm. Again, if you have uh, questions or comments, type them in that chat box. We'll take some from our live audience here. Go ahead, Mara. Do you have a microphone? No idea. Is it flashing green? Uh, it's flashing red. No, okay. it's yellow. Green. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so the resource thing, I'm a bit confused because I thought the parents were paying for everything. But um, in general, the question of whether we'll pay for somebody even though they have a lot of their own money and they're really rich, it's completely different whether you have a public health care system or not. Because in the U.S., that's sort of like a doctor's or a hospital decision. You know, do we want to do this? Maybe it's an ethical decision, but it's not really a resource allocation decision if the resources are private resources. 
you know, people don't get to allocate my money. Um, so, yeah, the question just seems completely different depending on which type of healthcare system you have. Well, it's certainly a different question, but it's not an irrelevant consideration. So even if it's self-funded, um, the as uh, Bob Trug argued in a, a, an editorial in JAMA, the healthcare infrastructure, the, the hospital, the professionals, the science, the research, all of that has often been as a result of public investment. So the public has a stake in the use of those resources. And there are consequences uh, in the context of scarcity for other patients. So it, even if it's a privately, totally privately funded, providing treatment for one patient in an ICU can affect other patients. So that might be a reason that those providers need to take into account. Now, obviously, they might have a huge amount of capacity. They might have a half-empty ICU and they might be there might be no possibility that it would influence another patient. And that would then uh, re take away that resource element for that particular patient. Um, but obviously, within the broader context of the, of the US, there are uh, very significant resource issues in terms of uh, the, the public, publicly funded health care, but also in terms of insurance provided health care. If you provide um, very expensive prolonged treatment for one patient, that has impacts on premiums for other people. Uh, so so the, the question of resources is still relevant even in uh, largely private health care systems, but you're right, in different ways. One question online. Uh, we have two actually now. Um, the first question um, sets us in the context of orphan illnesses and, and is kind of asking whether or not those kinds of unique cases should be lumped in with a standard approach or whether there should be exceptions made for um, these kinds of things. And so do, does that affect your thinking at all that it, that it is this sort of rare orphan classification? Well, so, so these rare diseases are going to be relevant um, to the cost of treatment, often because uh, it, it's far more expensive. The treatments are far more expensive because it's the costs are spread across a much smaller number of individuals, um, and the companies have no incentive to reduce the price because it's going to be a large market. Um, it's, it's often relevant to the evidence, so in, in the context of these uh, very rare illnesses, like in Charlie's case, there can be zero evidence or very limited evidence. Um, and in terms of a public healthcare system, uh, in terms of how to weigh up which treatments do you fund, there's often going to be a preference to those treatments that are have supported by a, a solid body of evidence over those that really have no evidence behind them. But there is a, obviously a difference between lack of evidence and evidence that something doesn't work and for totally novel or experimental treatments if you never provide the treatment you'll never find out if they work um, so with these rare conditions we're going to have to have some flexibility uh, and that is going to need some extra provision some willingness to to provide these treatments now how how you accommodate that within a limited healthcare budget uh, it is an important and vexed question to which I don't have a a simple answer, but I do think that where there's a reasonable possibility of benefit, particularly perhaps where it's not going to be taking funds from the public health care system, um, that we ought to have some significant leeway for allowing it. And again, particularly where the alternative is certain death. Go ahead, Vanessa. This question comes uh, by way of Twitter, and it's more of a comment, but I think there's a good question um, as well. So. The person mentions that there were cases reached, um, they mentioned five um, in the UK this year where parents and doctors disagreed. They uh, indicated that all ruled in favor of the physicians withdrawing treatment. Um, and I think they're, um, whether or not that's completely accurate, you can maybe speak to, but um, I was curious that there were um, cases on the flip side, maybe from past years. So that's a very good question. And because one of the impressions that people sometimes get reading all those court transcripts and all those cases is that the courts are overly biased in favor of doctors or overly deferential to medical experts and so they're always deciding in favor of doctors it looks like the dice are pretty heavily loaded so there are a couple of cases in particular in the past where the courts have not sided with the professionals views there was a, a famous case in 
2006 of an infant with spinal muscular atrophy uh, where the professionals felt that providing treatment would be futile uh, the parents disagreed uh, and the court decided that the benefits to the child of continuing life prolonging treatment outweighed the burdens. It was about ventilation? It was about continued mechanical ventilation. Uh, there was another vexed case uh, called uh, about a little baby called Charlotte Wyatt where there were a number of decisions, number, the parents went to the courts a number of times and some of those decisions went uh, in, fa in favor of the health professionals. Others said, look, her, her condition's improved. She hasn't done as badly as the doctors had said. We, you, you shouldn't have these limits any longer in, uh, uh, to treatment. Uh, there's a very, uh, there's a, a very relevant case in terms of adults uh, about a, a gentleman called Mr. James, a case called Aintree versus, I can't remember the, the uh, citation. Somebody people, will find it online. <laughs> uh, so if, if people are interested, uh, they can email me and I'll, I'll send it your way, where there were a succession of, of court decisions the family wanted continued treatment for this uh, uh, older gentleman who had multiple organ failure, had been in ITU for a long, long time. Uh, the initial court said, look, it's, it's not futile um, to provide this treatment. It will keep him alive for some period of time in, in a state that he might value. And then there were subs later court decisions when he had deteriorated that made the opposite decision. So I'm, I'm in following up on that question, it seems like one difference you could hypothesize between the US and U the UK, sort of the flip side of deference to parental autonomy is deference to professional opinion. In the US, there is less deference, I would suggest, and in the UK more. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's, uh, that's one plausible interpretation. I think, uh, in fact, it's l uh, this impression is partly a function of the cases that reach the courts. So, these cases of conflict, the, the impression is that there are all these cases that are going to the courts, but actually they're small numerically. And as a proportion of all children in intensive care or adults in intensive care, they're tiny. And even if you'd look at those cases where there are disagreements, uh, the literature suggests that only a tiny fraction of disagreements are intractable. So it's really only those cases where there are disagreement, where professionals feel they just cannot Agree. I mean, the easiest thing to do for these professionals would have been to just go along with these parents. It would have been vastly easier. Why didn't they do it? Well, because they felt in their heart of hearts that it would be harmful to this child. They, I mean, they, they put themselves through an enormous amount because that's what they felt was, was best for Charlie. They're rare on both sides of the Atlantic, yeah. these cases, yeah. All right, this is my own question. Uh, I think we may have a couple more coming in online, but I want to follow up on this question of harm, both to Charlie and to society or whatever, these, these hypothetical patients that might be prevented from uh, having a, access to a facility. Um, so in the case of Charlie, my understanding was there was a dispute about whether or not he was in pain and the extent of pain and these sorts of questions of just professional disagreement, um, as there was professional disagreement to about the potential benefits of the experimental therapy. Um, and then with respect to the, and so I want you to address that and what, how, like what's the best case one can make that Charlie would be harmed? I, I get the idea that maybe this isn't in his best interests, but I don't know that I necessarily see the harm argument to Charlie. And then with respect to these other folks, um, it's hard for me to conceptualize that as a harm. Um, sure, they've failed to have an opportunity to benefit potentially from having a bed, but how have they been? Well, so is it is it is it conceptually so, so, uh, so, the case that they've been harmed in so, some way? So let's so let's unpick both of those. So, so my reason for thinking that uh, that Charlie was uh, it wasn't certain, but there was a significant chance that he would be harmed was that he was, he was ventilated, uh, he was completely paralyzed, uh, he was deaf, uh, he was unable to see because he couldn't open his eyes. Um, now, we know from all the other patients that we look after in intensive care that continuing intensive care is not pleasant. And the children who are in intensive care and the adults are uncomfortable some of the time. They cry, they're tearing, um, and despite our best efforts at providing pain relief, um, 
It's not because we leave them in pain. We try to, but we are always balancing the the risks and benefits of the analgesia. And uh, and children, adults are in pain at least some of the time. In his case, he couldn't show when he was in pain. Nobody could see it. He lay there completely still. That's one of the reasons why his parents said, look, he's not in pain. But those nurses and doctors who looked after all the other patients in entire ICU knew that other children in the same situation are at least sometime in pain. So, the, so, the, the, so it looks like there was a significant subjective harm. Now, it's possible that he was so profoundly encephalopathic that he was insensible to pain. Um, if, that's, if that were the case, it really seems that inconceivable that the treatment would help him, but equally inconceivable that it would harm him to provide it. Um, now, we might, we might think that that kind of dilutes our reason for opposing treatment, well, but, but it, it, in terms of what, one way to think about it is what, well, what could we put a number on it? Is there there's some probability? Let's imagine that there's some, that there's an 80% chance that he was completely insensible. He, he was had neither pain nor positive experience. But there's a, a kind of 20% chance that he was experiencing pain. I, I think uh, if, the, if there was a strong chance that he would benefit, that might be worthwhile putting him through. But the best estimates were that the chance of benefit was very, very small uh, from this, this treatment. In terms of harm to others, you point to that. Well, the reality is, and it's a very uncomfortable reality, uh, is that patients who are not able to access intensive care um, suffer more complications. They have higher mortality. There, there's some very, uh, not terribly recent, but very clear evidence from adult intensive care in the UK uh, that patients who are declined ICU admission have risk-adjusted higher morbidity, higher mortality. These, the specialized intensive care unit where Charlie was for months a patient was at 95% occupancy throughout that whole period. I know from dealing with this hospital from patients who I have who, that quite often when we ring them up, they say, no, we can't, we can't take your patient um, because they're full. So they stay somewhere else with less specialized expertise. That might just be a delay in treatment, but sometimes it's gonna mean that they can't get ECMO because there's no bed in the intensive care unit. So there are very real harms to using a scarce uh, resource if the, uh, for other patients. Now, if the benefit's enough, then it, it's absolutely worth it. But, but the best estimates were that the chance of Charlie benefiting were very, very small. Any other questions online? Uh, we actually have several. I'm trying to figure out a fair way to uh, choose among them. So I guess I'll just, about one to, more. <laughs> uh, I'll just go back to the, the earliest one that I have here. But uh, so they note that a standard dispute resolution mechanism in futility disputes is to allow transfer. Since this case, it seems unique in that it doesn't allow that. Um, they ask, should we rethink the transfer mechanism? Specifically, should treating facilities sometimes refuse an available transfer, perhaps on some of the grounds of reasoning that you're, um, you suggested here? So, so it's a very good, very good question, and uh, one that I've thought a lot about. Um, I absolutely agree that in general, where there are other facilities, other physicians who are willing to provide treatment, that we should, in general, allow that. There's some interesting questions about cross-national transfers, particularly where the basis for allowing the treatment might be on the basis of values that are not uh, regarded as reasonable within the jurisdiction that the, the patient comes from. So for, for example, if it were the case, uh, and it wasn't obvious that this was the case, but if it was the case that, that there was another hospital willing to accept uh, Charlie because they had some very strong views on the basis of the sanctity of life that treatment must always be provided, um, should never be withdrawn, uh, parents should never be overruled. That's a kind of value, core value that is arguably a reasonable view, but it's not a value that the, the UK legal framework can accept as being reasonable. Because the, the, the UK legal framework says, no, treatment shouldn't always be provided, even 
even if parents want it. So you can't use that value for saying that it's reasonable to then allow transfer out of that jurisdiction. So there's some really interesting questions about the, the limits to medical tourism um, uh, when, when that would conflict with the prevailing legal and social norms. One more quick one. It would, it would require a quick answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, this could be answered quickly, I suppose. If the case had been decided in the parents' favor, what effect would that have had on such cases in the future in terms of precedent? Would it have dramatically changed anything, in your opinion, or would it just be one pebble in a... <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I, I think one of, the, one of the paradoxes of the case is that the, the higher the public attention the higher the stakes were for the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. So the, the stronger, in a sense, the reason to resist allowing the parents, because as I suggested earlier, if the courts had gone along with the parents, other parents would have been motivated to think, look, if you get enough attention, if you get enough tweets, yeah. uh, if you get enough front pages, the doctors will give in. Um, now, it might have just caused a very specific question. It might have been just that if you have an experimental treatment and health professionals are available and you've got the funding, um, that only in that case the treatment should be available. So then it wouldn't have had any relevance for other public health system cases. Um, but it's not clear to me that it would have just had that very limited precedential effect. Thank you very much. We need to stop. Thanks to Children's Mercy Kansas City and the Claire Giannini Trust, both of which help support this webinar series. We could go on and on, but thanks so much for a provocative talk. Lots of papers by Professor Wilkinson uh, online, so Google his work if you want to read more about his thoughts on this and related cases. And don't forget to pick up his book, Death or Disability. I forgot to mention in my intro that you're a practicing neonatologist. So in addition to being a philosopher and a policy person, he actually takes care of sick babies and maybe will be on that board that decides where to set the resource threshold. Thank you. Thanks, sir.